All right. Um, cool. So today we're going to talk about fisheries. You know me. This is this is my favorite topic. My favorite thing on the planet, other than other than my wife, my family, and my pets. This is my favorite favorite thing on the planet. Um, this is what drives me. This is what makes me happy. This is why I do what I do. Um, we're gonna do um, at least three lectures on this this is kind of the breakdown so typically with a lot of topics i used to i you know you start with like the history you go back and then kind of go forward i'm gonna do that last um today is going to be more intro to fisheries and then my connection um to fisheries and and i think probably a lot of what you um are connected to maybe you don't realize it yet um and then local stuff. So we're going to talk mostly about California fisheries and a little bit of Mexico because I've, I've done a lot of fishing and, and research in Mexico. Um, Baja. I have a couple, a few videos that we're going to show. Most of them are really short. There's one of them is a TED Talk. It's one of my favorite TED Talks about fishing and food. I I love food. I grew up in a house that food was, uh, was an important part. My mom was a cook and she was a, a food stylist growing up. She worked for the studios. So, um, we always had a lot of good, um, connection to food. My dad still to this day eats red meat, potatoes, and white bread, and he can't have any seasoning, which is like boggles my mind. So my mom would always make my sister and I like really fancy foods and stuff like that. Um, and so one of the big reasons I love to fish is not just the thrill of the recreation of fishing, but it's it's the food aspect of it. It's probably the it's definitely the most um, or primary protein that I eat. My my wife and I probably probably like eighty percent or more of our protein that we eat is fish that I catch, um, and that's always been important to me. So that kind of connection with with food is is a huge part of of what i do week 12 we'll do more global fisheries so we'll talk more about kind of you know a lot of the global stocks bluefin around the the world atlantic cod things that that are going on um, around the world and different practices um you've talked a little bit about it last week dr ray showed you kind of some otter trawl nets and gill nets we'll talk a little bit about that today just what what is the typical fishing in in California and but we'll talk more about that on a global scale and then week 13 we'll do um kind of the the history and the future of of fisheries how you can be an advocate sustainable fisheries I have a couple things um so I'll talk for we'll see how long it goes because of the videos and stuff but um I have a few data sets that I found on cowfish and wildlife that I want us to explore. I know you've been working with some data and a lot of you are GIS savvy. So you could either go the data route and kind of explore some catch data. Um, fish and wildlife actually has some really great data online of certain uh, fisheries, ground fisheries and things. Um, but they also have some um, um, data for if you want to pull it up on GIS and and kind of explore the mapping side of it. So we'll do that. And we're going to have be right before lunch, we're going to have a little sustainable seafood um, menu. We're going to look at some menus um, and see how we can be better advocates for that. This is my connection to fishing. Um, so I started, I started fishing when I was a little kid. I caught my first fish when I was, when I was 10 um and never looked back it was i still remember it to this day it was is actually it wasn't this catfish it was a different catfish but it was at the same pond it was a local pond in simi valley that we used to go fishing um i grew up fly fishing so i love i love the aspect of fly fishing and it's very peaceful it's very meditative it's it's also just a way to connect to nature um and go hiking and explore but i also you know like the the recreation aspect of it look at that hat that was that was it man that was the day um oh, yes. it's weird seeing me without a beard i've had a beard since i was like 21 um um i i used to do a lot of spear fishing i don't do as much anymore i've kind of become like an old curmudgeon is not the right word but i like being dry and staying up on top of the boats and just catching that way if it's if it's not on a 
a university boat because I still I, I still help out um, my master's advisor, Mark Steele, Dr. Steele's husband at, at CSUN with a lot of his research. No drinking on university boats, but when you're in Baja rooster fishing, that's uh, that's the liquid of choice that's required. Um, this is a, this is what I, this was kind of a fish that I I wanted to catch for a long time. Rooster fish. It's got these awesome dorsal fins and they can get massive. I I cut that down in uh, Rancho Leonero, uh right near Cabo a few years ago. Um, so I love that aspect of it. Um, the reason I I am teaching today and the reason I decided to kind of pursue this as a career was really when the MPA networks, we talked a little bit about MPAs last week, when these were coming on and they were kind of like, there was a lot of the hearings going on in the early 2000s, 2008, 2010, around that, that range. That's right when I was out of undergrad. And so I was working in the public aquarium industry. I loved just being around fish and fishing and stuff like that. Um, but I had some really great um, mentors and, and um, uh, professors that I worked with at San Diego State that were fish ecologists. So I was always kind of interested in grad school, but not sure because I had already had a lot of time invested um, in the public aquarium field. I was on my third aquarium at that time. Um, but I started going to these hearings and um, I know Dr. Ray was, was around for a lot of those too. As a young scientist, I was sitting here and a lot of these, you know, big fisheries biologists, Mark Carr at UC Santa Cruz, Larry Allen at CSUN, um, were getting up and they were talking about what they thought the vision of the MPA should be, right? They were big advocates for a lot of, you know, the as, as many um, of these MPA networks as we could, kind of the maximum amount of, of territories or regions that, that had them. And then you had the fishers, right? And trying to change my verb, I, fisherman is was always something that I used growing up, but it's it, fishers is um, the correct way to say it now. Um, the fishers in the room, which were predominantly white men, um, were all on their kind of side of these hearings in their black shirts. So they all came unified with these black shirts and they were very much anti the MPA networks, right? And so it was really, you know, there's and they had they had a lot of reasoning for it, right? A lot of these MPAs were fishing grounds for either where they had their spots where they went and shot yellowtail or white sea bass off the kelp bed, or it was these recreational fishermen that were going out and, you know, had their boats and now all of a sudden the spot that they typically go and take their um, half day, three quarter day boat every single day was now going to be an MPA, right? So now it's going to start infringing on their livelihood. They're going to have to start finding new spots, new areas to go. Um, so they were pretty much zero, right? And I saw both sides of it. I was a fisherman. I am a fisherman. So I relate to their struggles, but also as an academic and an aspiring marine biologist, I was like, but all these scientists are saying something very different, right? And there's this whole concept of, you know, it's probably going to be difficult. It was really hard to sell them on this aspect of let's preserve this area, no take areas, right? Um, and so, you know, the one that we were just at, Abalone Cove, right? So we just drove past that when we were in Palos Verdes. Um, there's, there's a lot of, of people that were... Um, that was an area that I grew up diving and and going to. They were, you know, didn't want that to to be a an an MPA. But it's like you know the whole concept of it is if we protect it and you allow it to kind of rebound for a few years, it's actually going to improve the fisheries. If growing up when I was you know in the early '90s, mid '90s, when I started going on these wreck boats, especially in the early 2000s, fishing sucked. It was really hard to catch fish out here. Um, you wanted to go out and catch yellowtail, halibut, white sea bass. It was a struggle. If you did catch one, it was going to be small. They would usually take you to a kelp forest, just fish the edge of a kelp forest, and you'd load up on sand bass and calico bass. Has anyone eaten bard or sand bass or calico bass here? Yeah. 
And most of you have it because it's not a commercial fishery. So you can't buy it in, in any of the, the restaurants. You can't buy it fish in tacos. fish tacos. Yeah, they're they're yeah. the best. So you're going to see calico bass a lot because it's my, it's my favorite fish. This is a calico bass, sometimes called kelp bass. Um, yeah, I think so. Yep. Um, it says I'm talking up here, so I'm assuming so. Um, these are calico bass right here. Um, best, I mean, I'm sure, how many of you like eating yellowtail? Bluefin tuna, salmon, white halibut, white sea bass. You've all heard of those and you probably like all of those, right? Calico bass is, 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 if I had to choose between a good calico bass, fresh calico bass steak, halibut, white sea bass, I will choose calico bass. It is by far, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, and and the, it's just the flavor is really great. Like you can make it into ceviche. So I usually make mine into ceviche and it's it's phenomenal. Um, but most people don't know about it because you have to actually have a fishing license, go out and catch your own fish and go prep it yourself. Right. So um, it's not something that you can even go into a local fish market, Santa Barbara fish market or whatever, and, and buy a calico bass. So. So I was, you know, in a struggle, right? So I'm, I'm hearing all of these professors saying all of this, this science that makes sense, and I'm believing them because they have data to show that, and and you know, many years of 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 this type of research to say like this is actually going to improve the fisheries. At the time, there was tons of wreck boats out here. The early '90s, early two, uh, or mid late 90s early 2000s we had tons of wreck boats in ventura channel islands harbor dana point marina del rey had a bunch of boats which they don't really have anymore um and you go out and you would spend 50 60 bucks to go out for a half day and you wouldn't really get any fish coming back and so something had to happen but the, these fishermen were dead set like you cannot take away our fisheries right these are our fisheries um and so California, when the 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 folks that were in charge of creating the the network kind of met halfway, there was this meeting where they 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 had and it's kind of more towards the academic side. So there's more MPAs, definitely than the fishermen want. They don't want any, <laughs> but a lot of there's a lot of areas that that were not selected or they were reduced in size to to kind of accommodate for that. Um, We'll get into MPAs. I know Dr. Ray is going to talk a little bit more about MPAs down the road, but I don't care who you, you talk to. Um, the evidence is overwhelming. These MPAs are working, and especially for the fishing. Fishing has never been better in California. It's, it's spectacular right now. If you want to go out, if you go on a half-day boat and you spend, it's a little bit more now, it's like probably 60, 70 bucks, you'll come back with a bag of fish, and they'll be really good quality fish. Um, yellowtail has come back. Yellowtail fishery is great. The halibut fishing has been amazing. White sea bass, um, especially with climate change. If you talk to a lot of the, the, um, the local fishermen, they are very much advocates for climate change, especially in California, because it's pushing um, a lot of the fisheries that you typically have to go down to Mexico for, bluefin tuna, yellowfin tuna, a lot of your yellowtail dorado are starting to creep up into Catalina now. So every year for about a month, six weeks, the backside of Catalina, you can go catch bluefin, you can catch dorado, which is you can catch marlin, which is which is really crazy. And so it's slowly moving its way up. Ecologically, it's not great, right? But, but fishers um, absolutely love it. So this is when I decided that I wanted to get into to academia, right? I wanted to kind of be that person to at least help with that interaction with the, the actual research in academia, but had that fishing background and kind of understood the, the fishers. Because I think the biggest thing that, that went against this whole process, if they're gonna do it again, was these academics came in and old white men were basically like, nope, this is how it is. We're the smartest people in the room. You're gonna listen to us. And then there's these fishers that are like, well, I don't care about your degree. I've been fishing for 30, 40 years. And maybe this is like second generation, third generation running this boat. 
we know more than you do. We're out here every single day. We know what the take is. And you come out here three, four times a, a, a year, or maybe you're just getting our data and now you're telling us what to do, right? And so there was no middle person that was like, all right, like let's let's kind of mediate the situation. And so each side kind of hated each other and it didn't go well for negotiations. So that's what kind of led to that. Uh, but still to say, this was just, um, I love this lecture too, because it's my only way of sharing my photos of all the fun <laughs> stuff that I do. Um, this was right before the semester. My wife and I finally went on our honeymoon. It took us over a year to go, but we went up to Montana and fished Yellowstone. And so even like your national parks, like you can actually go and fish and take fish, right? Even though it's a national park, there are certain fish like like the Yellowstone cutthroat, which is an endangered species, you can't take home and eat with you. But like this rainbow trout, I let this one go because we didn't have any way to cook it in our hotel. But I could have, but I could have taken this home and I could have eaten that, right? And so there is that protection of this land um, and its natural resources to allow you to kind of take the fish out. And so, pretty special place if you if you haven't gone there. Um, this is. It's also kind of really my connection with my friends. And so I've, you know, a lot of the friends that I've maintained over the years um, is either at work in academia where we have this common knowledge or it's through fishing. And so this is just, this is me when I'm, this was, this is when I was um, a grad, grad student still and couldn't cut my beard at all. Um, this is um, fishing kelp forest off the artificial reef with, with the Sanskrit sea sun. Um, if you know how to fish, there's fish out there, right? And so it really is teach person how to fish, right? And, and um, how many of you are interested or, or have caught a fish before? Oh my gosh. Um, it's the best. And especially when you can take that fish, this fish is undersized. We'll talk about the, the size restriction for this because this fishery about 2012, 2011 was collapsing big time. And US fish or cow fish and wildlife made one major change and it was changing the legal size from 12 inches to 14 inches something very minimal, right? If, if you saw a 12 inch fish and a 14 inch fish, you could, you could probably tell one's bigger because one's going to be fatter, but it's not a huge difference. Just that difference alone completely rebounded this entire fishery, which is awesome. Um, and so this is my connection. We're going to be, you know, I, I do a lot of fancy seafood stuff when whenever we get it. This is all, so this is fresh yellowtail that I caught. Um, and has anyone had uni before? We're gonna have uni at the cultured cultured abalone farm. We're gonna get some uni. Um, uni is one of my favorite. We're gonna get some um, some abs. This is called mermaid style when you cook them in the shell. Delicious. I took um, uh, I got master class for my um, for. Christmas last year, and I went through Gordon Ramsay's kind of um, cook it, his first round because he has two master classes. His first episode of his master class is how he learned how to cook scrambled eggs in French culinary school, and he does it with uni. So he'll sit there and and he he puts he'll scramble the eggs. And he puts like this heavy French cream in it and stuff to make them very fluffy. And then he puts one to two of the, so these are the gonads of the, of the, the urchin. Um, very kind of milky salts, right? And um, he mixes that in and fluffs it. And then he puts a couple on the bottom, puts the hot eggs on top so it melts it and then he garnishes it. It's phenomenal. Like it's absolutely, you're never going to eat a scrambled eggs the, the way, um, a different way after that. It's pretty awesome. Udi's a little expensive to get now. I mean, you can order it. So the cultured abalone, they'll talk about their 
um, aquaculture farm, you can order from them. They'll send you live abalone and urchins. You'll get them next day. The way that they prep them, they, abalone can actually be um, in there for like three days. They put them like in a little wet sponge and they can ship them. So you get them alive um, and get like, like a, a dozen abalone and like eight to 10 urchins. It's going to cost you like 150 bucks. But um, it, it feeds a lot of people. You don't need a ton. Um, and it's it's kind of that unique way of, of getting connected um, with local seafood. But also, I think it's it's really important. When I talk about seafood to a lot of people, yeah, I'd love to eat bluefin tuna all the time. Yeah, I'd love to, to eat um, shrimp and, you know, certain salmons all the time. It's not sustainable. And so the thing that really has helped me with that is, is exp ex expanding my palate and really trying different things. Um, so that way, when you're going to restaurants and stuff, the first thing that you're, you're ordering is not, a you know, a spicy tuna roll, which now you've not only just killed the bluefin tuna, but now you're mixing it with a bunch of spicy mayonnaise sauce and it's, you know, doing it a disservice anyway. So why are you even eating it? Um, this is um this is one of my favorite TED Talks, and I think we're gonna this is not California related. It's a it's it's like 18 minutes or something like that. Um, but it's really that connection with food. So I thought we'd start off with that. Dan Barber. I've known a lot of fish in my life. I've loved only two. That first one was, uh, it was more like a passionate affair. It was a beautiful fish, flavorful, textured, meaty, the best seller on the menu. What a fish. Even better, it was farm raised to the supposed highest standards of sustainability, so you can feel good about selling it. I was in a relationship with this beauty for several months. One day, the head of the company called and asked if I'd speak at an event about the farm's sustainability. Absolutely, I said. Here's a company trying to solve what's become this unimaginable problem for us chefs. How do we keep fish on our menu? For the past 50 years, we've been fishing the seas like we clear cut forests. It's hard to overstate the destruction. 90% of large fish, the ones we love, the tuna, the halibut, the salmon, swordfish, the clubs, there's almost nothing left. So, for better or for worse, aquaculture, fish farming, should be a part of our future. A lot of arguments against it. Fish farms pollute. Most of them do anyway. And they're inefficient. Take tuna. Major drawback. It's got a feed conversion ratio of 15 to 1. That means it takes 15 pounds of wild fish to get you one pound of farm tuna. Not very sustainable. It doesn't taste very good either. So here, finally, was a company trying to do it right. I wanted to support them. The day before the event, I called the head of PR for the company. Let's call him Don. Don, I said, just to get the facts straight, you guys are famous for, for farming so far out to sea, you, you don't pollute. That's right, he said, we're so far out, the waste from our fish gets distributed, not concentrated. And then he added, we're basically a world unto ourselves. That feed conversion ratio, 2.5 to 1, he said, best in the business. 2.5 to 1, great. Like 2.5 what? what? What are you feeding? Sustainable proteins, he said. Great, I said. Got off the phone. And that night I was lying in bed and I thought, what the hell is a sustainable protein? <laughs> so 
the next day, just before the event, I called Don. I said, Don, what are some examples of sustainable protein? Said he didn't know. He would ask around. Well, I got on the phone with a few people in the company. No one could give me a straight answer. Until finally, I got on the phone with the head biologist. Let's call him Don, too. <laughs> Don, I said, what are some examples of sustainable protein? Well, he mentioned some algae and some fish meal. And then he said chicken pellets. He said chicken pellets. He said, yeah, feathers, skin, bone meal, scraps, dried, and processed into feed. He said, what percentage of your feed is chicken? Thinking, you know, 2%. Oh, it's about 30%, he said. I said, Don, what's sustainable about feeding chicken to fish? <laughs> there was a long pause on the line. And he said, there's just too much chicken in the world. Okay, I fell out of love with this fish. Yeah, not because I'm some self-righteous goody two-shoes booty. I actually am. Now I fell out of love with this fish because I swear to God, after that conversation, the fish tasted like chicken. This second fish well, it's a different kind of love story. It's the romantic kind. The kind where the more you get to know your fish, you love the fish. <laughs> I first ate it at a restaurant in southern Spain. A journalist friend had been talking about this fish for a long time. She kind of set us up. Okay. It came to the table a bright, almost shimmering white color. The chef had overcooked it, like twice over. Okay. Amazingly, it was still delicious. Who can make a fish taste good after it's been overcooked? I can't, but this guy can. Let's call him Miguel. Actually, his name is Miguel. And no, he didn't cook the fish and he's not a chef, at least the way that you and I understand it. He's a biologist at Veta La Palma. It's a fish farm in the southwestern corner of Spain. It's at the tip of the Guadalquivir River. Until the 1980s, the farm was in the hands of the Argentinians. They raised beef cattle on what was essentially wetlands. They did it by draining the land. They built this intricate series of canals and they pushed water off the land and out into the river. Well, they couldn't make it work, not economically. And ecologically, it was a disaster. Killed like 90% of the birds, which for this place is a lot of birds. And so in 1982, a Spanish company with an environmental conscience purchased the land. What did they do? They reversed the flow of water. They literally flipped the switch. Instead of pushing water out, they used the channels to pull water back in. They flooded the canals. They created a 27,000 acre fish farm. Bass, mullet, shrimp, eel. And in the process, Miguel and this company completely reversed the ecological destruction. The farm's incredible. I mean, you've never seen anything like this. You stare out at a horizon that is a million miles away, and all you see are flooded canals and this thick, rich marshland. I was there not long ago with Miguel. He's an amazing guy. Like three parts Charles Darwin and one part Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> okay? There we are, sliding through the wetland. You know, I'm panting and sweating. I have mud up to my knees. And Miguel is calmly conducting a biology lecture. Here he's pointing out a rare black shoulder kite. Now he's mentioning the mineral needs of phytoplankton. And here, here he sees a grouping pattern that reminds him of the Tanzanian giraffe. Yeah, 
It turns out Miguel spent the better part of his career in the Makumi National Park in Africa. I asked him how he became such an expert on fish. I said fish. I didn't know anything about fish. I'm an expert in relationships. And then he's off launching into more talk about rare birds and algae and strange aquatic plants. And don't get me wrong, I was really fascinated, you know, the biotic community unplugged kind of thing, you know. Great. But I was alone. And my head was swooning over that overcooked piece of delicious fish I had the night before. So I interrupted him. I said, Miguel, what makes your fish taste so good? He pointed at the algae. I know, dude, the algae, the phytoplankton, the relationships, it's, it's amazing, right? But what are your fish eating? And what's your feed conversion ratio? Well, he goes on to tell me, it's such a rich system that the fish are eating what they'd be eating in the wild. The plant biomass, the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, it's what feeds the fish. The system is so healthy, it's totally self-renewing. There is no feed. Ever heard of a farm that doesn't feed its animals? Later that day, I was driving around this property with Miguel, and I asked him, I said, for a place that seems so natural, unlike any fish, I don't like any farm I'd ever been at. I said, How do you measure success? Well, at that moment, it's as if a film director called for a set change. And we rounded the corner and saw the most amazing sight, thousands and thousands of pink flamingos. A literal pink carpet for as far as you could see. That's success, he said. Look at their bellies, pink, they're feasting. Feasting, I was totally confused. I said, Miguel, aren't they feasting on your fish? <laughs> yes, he said. We lose 20% of our fish and fish eggs to birds. All right, well, last year, this property had 600,000 birds on it, more than 250 different species. It's become today the largest and one of the most important private bird sanctuaries in all of Europe. I said, Miguel, isn't a thriving bird population like the last thing you want on a fish farm? <laughs> He shook his head. No, he said, we farm extensively, not intensively. This is an ecological network. The flamingos eat the shrimp, the shrimp eat the phytoplankton. So the pink of the belly, the better the system. Okay, so let's review. A farm that doesn't feed its animals and a farm that measures its success on the health of its predators. A fish farm, but also a bird sanctuary. Oh, and by the way, those flamingos, they shouldn't even be there in the first place. They brood in a town 150 miles away, where the soil conditions are better for building nests. Every morning, they fly 150 miles into the farm. And every evening, they fly 150 miles back. They do that because they're able to follow the broken white line of Highway A92. No kidding. You know, I was imagining a March of the Penguins thing, you know? So I looked at Miguel, I said, Miguel, do they fly 150 miles to the farm? And then do they fly 150 miles back at night? Do they do that for the children? He looked at me like I just quoted a Whitney Houston song. He said, no, they do it because the food's better. <laughs> you know, I didn't mention the skin of my beloved fish, which was delicious. And I don't like fish skin. I don't like it seared. I don't like it crispy. It's that acrid, tar-like flavor. I almost never cook with it. Yet when I tasted it at that restaurant in southern Spain, it tasted not at all like fish skin. It tasted sweet and clean, like you were taking a bite of the ocean. I mentioned that to Miguel, and he nodded. He said, the skin acts like a sponge. 
the last offense before anything enters the body. It evolved to soak up impurities. And then he added, but our water has no impurities. Okay, a farm that doesn't feed its fish, a farm that measures the success by the success of its predators. And then I realized when he says a farm that has no impurities, he made a big understatement because the water that flows through that farm comes in from the Guadalquivir River, the river that carries with it all the things that rivers tend to carry these days, chemical contaminants, pesticide runoff. And when it works its way through the system and leaves the water, it's cleaner than when it entered. The system is so healthy, it purifies the water. So not just a farm that doesn't feed its animals, not just a farm that measures the health, that is success by the health of its predators, but a farm that's literally a water purification plant. And not just for those fish, but for you and me as well. Because when that water leaves, it dumps out into the Atlantic. A drop in the ocean, I know, but I'll take it and so should you. Because this love story, however romantic, is also instructive. You might say it's a recipe for the future of good food. Whether we're talking about bass or beef cattle. What we need now is a radically new conception of agriculture, one in which the food actually tastes good. <laughs> right? Mm. But for a lot of people, that's a bit too radical. We're not realists, us foodies. We're lovers. We love farmers markets. We love small family farms. We talk about local food. We eat organic. And when you suggest these are the things that will ensure the future of good food, someone somewhere stands up and says, hey, guy, <laughs> I love pink flamingos. But how are you going to feed the world? How are you going to feed the world? Can I be honest? I don't love that question. No, not because we already produce enough calories to more than feed the world. One billion people will go hungry today. One billion, that's more than ever before. Because of gross inequalities in distribution, not tonnage. Now, I don't love this question because it's determined the logic of our food system for the last 50 years. Feed grain to herbivores, pesticides to monocultures, chemicals to soil, chicken to fish. And all along, agribusiness has simply asked, if we're feeding more people more cheaply, how terrible could that be? That's been the motivation, it's been the justification, it's been the business plan of American agriculture. We should call it what it is, a business in liquidation. A business that's quickly eroding the ecological capital that makes that very production possible. That's not a business. It is an agriculture. Our bread basket is threatened today, not because of diminishing supply, but because of diminishing resources. Not by the latest combine and tractor invention, but by fertile land. Not by pumps, but by fresh water. Not by chainsaws, but by forests. And not by fishing boats and nets, but by fish in the sea. Want to feed the world? Let's start by asking, how are we going to feed ourselves? Or better, how can we create conditions that enable every community to feed itself? To do that, don't look at the agribusiness model for the future. It's really old and it's tired. It's high on capital, chemistry, and machines. And it's never produced anything really good to eat. Instead, let's look to the ecological model. That's the one that relies on 2 billion years of on-the-job experience. Look to Miguel. Farmers like Miguel. Farms that aren't worlds unto themselves. Farms that 
restore instead of deplete. Farms that farm extensively instead of just intensively. Farmers that are not just producers, but experts in relationships. Because they're the ones that are experts in flavor too. And if I'm gonna be really honest, they're a better chef than I'll ever be. You know, I'm okay with that. Because if that's the future of good food, it's gonna be delicious. Thank you. What do you think? I connect with anybody? Thoughts? <laughs> Reflections? <laughs> Romantic? I, I think I've seen a TED Talk before read about that place, and every time it's always, you know, changes the way you think about your It's it's true, and so you, I, I think I think everyone, you know, I I remember being a, a an undergrad, and I was on the top ramen diet, and right, it's 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 hard to eat fancy and and all that stuff. Um, you don't have to for a lot of these things. You don't have to. It it doesn't cost much, and so a lot of these actual local fisheries here are relied upon by low income communities, right? They go out. You can go out. We'll talk about ways that you can go fishing if you learn how to fish. Greatest skill set that I've ever been taught is how to fish. Um, I can go out and I go out. I try to get out once a month, usually during like peak fish fishing season, late spring to the end of summer. I'll, I'll get out two to three times a month. But if I go out and I have one buddy that I, I fish 95% of the time with, um, his name is Mike. We have our spots that we go to and we've, acquired those by trial and error over decades of going out. I can catch about three months worth of protein for my wife and I on one trip, right? And that cost me about $60. That's having access to a boat, right? I don't have to purchase, I, I didn't purchase the boat. It's Mike's boat. Um, that's, that's gas, that's tackle, that's all this stuff. But you can actually go to fishing piers, which are free, you could go to Leo Carrillo just off our coast. There's lots of kelp forests that aren't in MPAs. Um, and I was just talking to Simon yesterday in Capstone. He went out and he showed me, got a bunch of lobster and he, he got like five sheephead and he got a bunch of calico bass free. Cause he, you know, has invested that time into learning how to, how to fish. Um, and so you don't have to spend a lot of money to, once you have that connection with food, and especially tasting the difference between a calico bass fish taco and then just like a Rubio's fish taco, like you're not going to go back. Everything's going to taste differently to you. And so it's important to have that kind of connection. But it's 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 that way for for all types of, of aquaculture, agriculture. Right. So these new kind of novel ways of coming up, which are very ecologically driven, are not just more sustainable and environmentally friendly. It's producing more fish and better quality fish. So that kind of old school methodology of these kind of monocultures or having these massive, you know, cattle industries and things like that. They're actually finding that if you have more of these pasture raised cattle farms, right, or these pasture raised chicken farms and things like that, not only is it producing better quality, healthier food, you could still, you know, you're extensively, you know, um, getting the meat instead of intensively um, getting it, but it's also improving the health of that ecosystem, the, those acreages of land that you're on too, right? They find it in Brazil and like coffee farms, instead of actually clear cutting these, these stretches of forest just to have, you know, coffee actually doing the land sharing aspect where you have lower amounts of coffee but it's around native habitat you get more pollinators in so fewer amounts of coffee bushes can produce more high quality coffee right so it's 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 not just in fisheries it's many types of ecological and different types of agricultural practices and it's catching on like the aquaculture and the mariculture industry has been changing drastically 10 years ago 20 years ago it was it was tough to eat farm raised um, fish or or any type of of seafood. It was high. It produced tons of waste. There's many that still do. So they ecologically were not 
really um, beneficial, beneficial or ecologically friendly. Uh, they just didn't taste good. Like there's just different taste. If you had now farm raised abalone in the past, and then you had a, a, a wild caught abalone, they tasted different. Um, it's not necessarily the case anymore. And you have farms like the cultured abalone that are doing it very sustainably and clean. Um, and so going through like, what is a fishery? Um, I think commonly a lot of, of people just think that it's, it's related to fish. Um, and that's not the case. It's, it's all types of aquatic species. So both freshwater, saltwater, fish, invertebrates, you name it, all types of organisms. So it could be halibut fisheries, right? Market squid. This is our largest fishery in California is our market squid. Um, it's the most pound wise and, and revenue generating market squid. Oysters, if everyone likes oysters, right? We have lots of, of oyster farms and going up Tamales Bay is a huge um, oyster area. Even down in Mexico, there's tons. Hawaii, we get a, a lot of oysters. Um, so huge um, um, economic benefits for the communities around there. If you've been to Tamales Bay, like that small little coastal city is very much driven off of their oysters. Every single restaurant has oysters. They 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 sell oysters. Like you name it. There's there's um, you know tours of the oyster farms. Um, and it's really 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 great. Um, so that's what we mean by fishery, right? It's any type of organized effort to catch um, any type of fish or or other other species. Um, oops, where is it going? There we go. Um, there's different types of fisheries. So there's really three kind of primary ones that we're going to talk about recreational fishing, um, getting out and fishing. Anybody can be a recreational uh, fisher. So it costs about, I think it's $52 now to get a seasonal pass, uh, a fishing license that's fresh water. So if you wanted to go for rainbow trout, if you wanted to go bass fishing in pyramid Lake or cast Lake or, Piru Creek or anything like that, it would cost you 50 bucks. Um, if you want to go to some kind of local pond or whatever, golf course pond, things like that, 50 bucks. If you want to go into the ocean, there's an ocean enhancement stamp. It's like 12 extra dollars. That's where you're going to actually get most of your protein. A lot of the freshwater fish that we have are more recreational. You're throwing them back. They're not the best quality tasting. Um, you could get like catfish and things like that. And know if you go down to the south and you fish catfish, they're different types of catfish. They taste different. If you're catching a catfish here, it's in a golf course pond that's been sitting for a while. You probably don't want to eat it, right? You can go into the LA River and catch carp. Don't want to eat it, even though people do. The catfish that you eat down in like in, in the south and the Gulf and stuff are, are very different. Um, but anybody can do it. All right. And so anglers have, you know, you're usually using rods, reels, other small gear, hoop nets, things like that. Um, it, it's it's an investment. If, if you think that's something that you want to do, you can get a, a rod and reel for less than a hundred bucks. A lot of times people are selling them on um, the internet and you get a cheap deal um, and it'll last you a lifetime. I still use the, 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 the rod that I use for most of my fishing um for like calico bass and things like that i bought about 22 years ago right and so they last if you take care of them um commercial fisheries are really the larger scale operations that are creating the most impact so so recreational fishing has an impact if you get on a, a recreation boat and you go on like a half day three quarter day so you could even do they do overnights too so most of the overnights is if you're interested in going for bluefin tuna or if you're interested in loading up on Yellowtail and Dorado, a lot of times you have to go out of San Diego and they'll go on overnights and they'll go out to like Coronado Islands or they go down into Mexico. Um, and so you're on that boat for two, three nights sometimes. They're, they're expensive trips, but you're coming back. So my buddy Mike just came back and he did a two night trip into Mexico and he caught his limit of bluefin every single day. So he brought back six bluefin. 80 pound bluefin each one so he brought back three massive coolers um of about like 150 180 pounds of of bluefin tuna just meat after it was all like and so 
I was very fortunate to have gotten some of that, right? And so, but that costs a lot of money, but that's more about the trip and the experience and all that stuff. Uh, but a half day going out doesn't cost you that money, but you have 40, 50 fishermen, fishers on that boat. There's probably, you know, out of Ventura Harbor, there's probably about 20 boats going out a day, half day. So they're going out twice a day. And then each one of those boats have about 40 fishers on it. And they can get bag limits of 20 fish. That's a lot of fish taken in one day, right? So the recreational impact is there, especially on local um, habitats, right? They're going to local kelp forests. They're going to local kind of sandy bottoms for habitats, for, for like halibut habitat. And so the recreational impacts are, are real. The recreation is why the calico bass and, and the sand bass almost like, like took a deep dive in, in 2011, 2012. But the commercial fisheries are really what's taken the most impact, right? And so commercial fisheries are these large scale operations. Um, who thinks, so top five uh, fisheries for California, what do you think they are? Like revenue and like poundage of 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 fish or things. What's up? Species. Yeah. What do you think? Um, top five. Squid is number one. Yep. No shrimp. Shrimps up there. Shrimp's common, but we don't have a huge shrimp fishery in California. The lobster's not up there. Nope. Tilapia. Nope. Huh. Abalone used to be up there, but not anymore. There's two of them on the on the screen right now. <laughs> <laughs> so so dun so Dungeness crab is is number two. Dungeness crab. Does someone say that? Oh, sorry, sorry. Dungeness crab. This, this is Pacific sardines. So our sardine industry is, is off the, off the, like there's tons and, and what makes our ecosystem. So the, the reason when you go out to the islands and you're going on the boats and you see all those dolphins, you see all this stuff, it's because of our, our bait fish fishery, right? We have tons of anchovy, we have tons of sardines, we have tons of mackerel. And so, um, and and that has only been increasing, which has been really great. It did take a decline in the you know late '90s, early 2000s. It's really come back. I think a lot of the MPAs, a lot of the new fix, fishing regulations have helped that. I think climate change is helping that a little bit too. I think a lot of the things that you typically would find in like Baja um, or like northern uh, Mexico are starting to creep up a little bit. But sardines is 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 why we have a lot of our healthy ecosystems out here drives that. Um, two others. One of them you're not you're not gonna get. Um, salmon. Salmon. Salmon's number four. Should. Be. <laughs> salmon. And then number five is Kellett's whelk. Welk is a snail that you can find in a lot of tide pools. Um, it's large, but but it's it's very popular in in Asian cuisine. So a lot of our Kellett's Welk, you can go to a fish market out here and, and you can get Kellett's Welk. They're tasty. Like I'm not a big fan of them. It's like it's like traditional escargot. If you've had escargot, is freshwater snails meets abalone kind of texture. It's kind of in the middle. Um, but huge um, fishery in, in kind of Asian cuisine. So we ship a lot of that out, right? And so most of the things that you think are really popular here, white sea bass, halibut, tuna, yellowtail, bass, rockfish. Rockfish is probably in like the six, seven range. So rockfish is probably close. Not even our top fisheries here. This is what generates most of the revenue. But also could create a lot of the impact, right? If you have a, a if you're too harsh on the sardine fishery here, that could drive a, a lots of destruction just ecologically to the whole food web, right? Sardines drive the food web, um, our marine food web. Squid is is pretty interesting. Um, Professor Gallipo is on a committee for 
for um, squid fisheries trying to help manage a lot of their fishing practices because they can be pretty detrimental, especially to birds. They go out at night, and so most of it's it's fisheries at night. They have these huge spotlights that they'll shine out and it attracts the squid up, but it kind of throws a lot of other species off um, their typical patterns when you have these massive lights that are shining and especially when you go out to the Channel Islands, like when you're driving out there at night, it's like a like a big party out there. Like somebody's throwing some massive raver because there's all these lights going everywhere. Um, so that's the commercial fishery. The other fishery is the aquaculture or mariculture. So aquaculture is typically freshwater. That's what we talk about when it's freshwater. Mariculture is saltwater. All right, so we're going to be going to the cultured abalone farm, which is a mariculture facility. They do um, red abalone and purple urchins. They do a variety of other things too. They they have um, dulse, um, which is a red um, algae that you know if you go to sushi restaurants and you see a lot of the red algae that's kind of like garnishes and stuff. Um, that's dulse. It's actually, it's a superfood. So it's actually healthier, um, like more healthy than, than spinach. It's like a superfood. You could get it at whole foods in like the dried format, very, very, um, healthy for you. Um, but they have a few different types of algaes that they grow. They're also, what's great about the cultured abalone farm that, that we'll talk about is they are, they, they've, they can mass produce abalone. It's, it's pretty incredible. Um, I got to work with them when I was at Cabrillo with the, the White Abalone Recovery Program because they helped the team start mass producing white abalone. Like so, Bodega Bay, who has led the the White Abalone Recovery Program, white abalone are are federally endangered. They were the first marine invertebrate listed on the then on the endangered species list. Um, I have a video on on here that we'll show a little later. Um, they were were up until about two, three years ago considered functionally extinct. So they were out in the wild, but there was just so few of them that they didn't they and they were so far away from one another that they couldn't reproduce. So it's kind of like when we say functionally extinct, it's like having five rhinos left and all all of them are males, right? Like there's no way of them coming back. That's what they thought was the case and they finally just found some babies out in the wild so it looks like they're reproducing and a lot of that is because um the the recovery program has been transplanting white abalone out for the last five to seven years through this practice so so the cultured abalone kind of helped the the whole team figure out ways to mass produce white abalone so we could put out about ten thousand of them a year which is which is quite a lot. So um, this is kind of like the 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 breadth of, of fisheries. Um, this is where we're going to be going. We'll do the, we'll show this short video. It's just like uh, three minutes or four minutes, and then we'll take a quick break. Um, but this is the cultured abalone farm that we're going to visit, which is this this was a, a PBS um, special that was just out on the cultured abalone called Earth Focus. I met Doug Bush, who is the general manager of the Poultry Outlawing Farm, um, when he came up here to give a seminar. The White Outlawing breeding program here has really been informed by a lot of stuff he's done with his commercial business in Santa Barbara. Um, that kind of technique for raising the larvae, how you grow them out, how you breed a lot in a very small space. That's all um, information that's incredibly important to outlawing conservation. There's a really strong uh, demand domestically. Almost all of our product is sold in California or just on the West Coast. We do everything in-house, we're a completely integrated farm. We have adult abalone, which we'll take into the hatchery and you get a tiny little fertilized abalone embryo. We get them by the millions. Uh, 24 hours later, they hatch and feed, 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 repeat and harvest at uh, about 100 grams, uh, about a three and a half inch shell length. And that's that's uh, the market size, and we crank those out 52 weeks a year. Much of what we do here in this program has been inspired by what abalone farmers do. People like Doug Bush and Dan Spezia at the Culture Abalone Farm have really helped us figure out how to maximize production in this lab. So we take their
Um, all right. Yeah. So 14th, 15th. Who else? Who doesn't like seafood? I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna try to convert Emily. Uh, is anybody allergic to seafood? Is anyone, yeah. yeah, that's different. Yeah. So I I do feel like seafood is different in many ways because also, like there's certain seafoods that if you don't prep well, you don't get them on ice immediately, or you don't. We can talk about the like processing of it, which I think. You know, everyone has different relationships with food. I've always, you know, I was kind of taught, like, if you're going to eat it, then you should be okay killing it um, humanely, um, which is why I usually don't eat a lot of red meat and stuff like that. I, 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 I My connection with that kind of ends with, with birds, right? Like, so I can do the bird thing if I needed to. I've gone hunting and, and like, for quail and, and things like that. Like, you know, the things that that are cute and furry and have feelings i i have a hard time killing so I, I i try not to eat those i do trade a lot so like i have i have friends that go elk hunting and they'll give me some elk and i'll give them some fish and stuff but um but the way that you prep a fish when you catch it changes the flavor of it and so a lot of times because you're getting fish that from people that might not they might have just caught the fish and threw it in on the deck or something like that or even if you're eating local fish here, a lot of the local fish is caught here. It's it's flash frozen. It's sent over to, you know, some, you know, different Asian countries to get processed because it's cheaper. And then it's sent back here, right? And so through that whole process, there's a lot of things that happen to that fish where it changes the flavor. Whereas if you go out and catch a fish and process it, humanely and properly get it on ice get it into your freezer it's it's night and day right it changes that fishy like even if you do it with anchovies and sardines which i mean many of you have probably at least smelled some like canned sardines and anchovies super fishy right but if you actually can your own sardines and anchovies um different they're totally different most of the fish, so when we go out and we we go fishing, we'll get bait. We'll go to the the bait dock. We'll get anchovies and 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 sardines, freshly caught right off the coast. All the extras that we have in our 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 bait well, I take home, and and most of them I I I um, dry for for the dogs, dog treats. But you can actually can them too, and they're they're super tasty. But it all goes into the processing and kind of what. Dan Barber was talking about is if you treat your fish well and you you have that connection and relationship to it, it totally changes the way that you experience food. So, you know, hopefully we'll have some opportunities to to taste some things that you haven't tasted before. Um, anybody can fish. We've already talked about that. California fishing license um, makes it open and accessible to everybody, even if you are from like a low uh, a low income community you, you don't have that extra i think i just looked it up it's 61 dollars now for a fishing license that can be pricey um especially if you want to go to the salt you have to have a 15 dollars enhancement stamp there's free fishing piers mostly in most communities there's one in ventura there's one um san pedro there's free fishing piers that when you're fishing off of those it's free and so you don't have to necessarily have a a fishing license to um, fish there. You still have to abide by all the regulations, the California regulations of bag limits and things like that, but you don't have to have a fishing license. I know many fishers because I've worked, when I worked at the Santa Monica Pier Aquarium, we would talk and interact with the fishers on that pier. When I worked at Cabrillo, we would go to the, the, the San Pedro Pier. Awesome people. Big, but like they they live there, they go there the three four days a week. That is their main source of protein. They they um, know the the fishing. They know the seasons. They know the types of it's it's their wealth of knowledge is incredible. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, yep. Cool. license it's annual yeah so from the time you purchase it so if you purchase it right now we'll go till november 5th next year you could um buy a lifetime fishing license which 
I think if you get to like my age, it doesn't make sense fi financially. Um, who knows? Like when they, you know, you have one year, it's hard to be busy or whatever. You have kids, you might not go fishing as much. It might not be um, if advantageous or it might not be cost effective. I think for my children, if they are into fishing half as much as I am, it'll make sense to get that for them when they turn 16. You get to fish free until you, you're 16. Um, and so then you have like, it's, it comes out to be, you know, a fraction of the cost and then you don't have to deal with the hassle of it every single year. Um, I'm frequently forgetting like when I, I got my, my fishing license. And so there's usually there's, there's a closure date for where we don't do a lot of fishing, which, which is usually winter time coming up ground fishing. Um, and then like the first fishing trip of the year, I'm out there, I'm like getting all my stuff for going out and I'm like shit i didn't get my fishing license so like i have to go they make it very easy you could just get online they'll give you a a virtual one for for the time being but um you have to have it on you you will get fined if you do not have it on you um and so they are very strict with that yeah the annual the lifetime one now is um it's like it's, we we can check after this. I think it's like sixteen hundred bucks, eighteen hundred bucks, something like that. Yeah. Uh, do, do you have a question? Yeah. Nope, it's free. Just the fee. Yeah, you, they'll give you a a regulation book, and so a lot of people will just go. I have a fish license. I'm going to go out. They'll trust that if they're going out on on uh you know a, a recreation boat that of course the the fishers that are running the boat will know all the size limits and all the bag limits and stuff like that that's not necessarily the case you are responsible for what you're taking home um and so and in the seasons that you're fishing and size limits and all that stuff so they'll give you a book, they'll send you one, or you can just go online, but you should know, especially for your region, if I'm fishing the Channel Islands, you know, we're targeting these fish, these fish species, how many can I have? What's the size limit? That's all on you. And um, I know people that have done that excuse. Oh, I'm, I, I thought that the, we were, you know, we're fishing on this boat. The boat captain said, it's okay. It's like, no, the boat captain put you there. You're the one who caught the fish. You're the one who decided to put it in your bag or not. Um, this is the main challenge, right? We were kind of talking about where we have an increased amount. So the projected um, population for the world is just under 10 billion. I think it's right now it's like 9.8 billion by 2050. And so we're already feeling this pressure for our fisheries. How are we going to feed that many people? Most of the the major cities in the world are are coastal cities that rely on fish, right? And now with how easy it is to transport and package fish, right? It's going all around the world, and so how can we do this sustainably? Um, I would say for for compared to mo we'll we'll talk about like kind of the global fisheries, but California, we have a large stretch of, stretch of coastline, right? And we have incredible fisheries. We have like amazing, amazing fisheries. Um, we do a pretty good job. I would say we're doing well compared to most states um, and internationally. Um, it's been most, most of the big changes have come over the past decade. If you were to compare like what's going on now to like the 70s, 80s, it's night and day, right? We were destroying our fisheries in like the 70s and 80s, which has led to the collapse of of most of the things that are on the verge of extinction or we have it, we can't eat anymore. Yep. California kind of lost, uh, like different large amounts of bycatch or yeah yeah so there's definitely bycatch laws and and we'll go over that um next tuesday um i won't be here thursday because i'm going i'm heading to oregon for wsn but next tuesday we'll jump into that but there's a lot of those um regulations that come with the type of gear that you can use so it limits the the number of bycatch um, but also things like giant sea bass so giant like black sea bass giant sea bass fished almost to extinction into the 80s right and and a lot of the fisheries there um 
they're they're so docile they're so easy to catch most spear fishermen you can go up and they're like big puppy dogs they'll swim right up to you like a 600 pound giant sea bass will swim right up to you and they can just go right and now you have 600 pounds of food to take home um it it totally collapsed they're very long lived they don't they you know um reproduction it takes them a long time to get to their reproductive age and so they were many people thought that they had gone extinct or were on the verge of extinction back in like the early 80s so there was a moratorium put in on them you could not catch any of them and that that's still in place they are state listed as endangered um, I don't think there'll ever be a fisheries for them again, even if they, they come back. And they are coming back quite, quite abundant. They're pretty abundant throughout the coast. If you go to most kelp forests, you'll see a giant sea bass, um, especially down like San Diego, where I help out with the artificial reef. We'll see two, three, four in a dive. There was one dive that I saw an aggregation of 18 giant sea bass that they were all in, getting in a spawning aggregation, which was really cool. Um, that fishery will probably never come back. I think it'll always be regulated. They maybe, you know, if, if everything goes well in like 20, 30 years, they might have kind of that, um, permit type, like hunting regulation, you know, they'll, they'll give permits out for like, you know, it could take 10 or whatever, but larger fisheries that, that use some of these practices like trawl nets and stuff like that, they're allowed to take two a year. So they have to limit their practices to take two. So if you do go, sometimes you can go to Santa Barbara fish market, um, San Pedro fish market, you'll see a giant sea bass there. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, I thought you can't catch that. That's bycatch. They're allowed two of those a year that they can, that they can harvest and sell. Um, if you see the, so, the, so like the, the filet mignon of, of fish out here are the cheeks. So on large fish, giant sea bass, larger tunas, like where their operculum is, it's like a hard bony structure. There's a very soft bit right around their cheeks that you get a steak that's like on giant sea bass is about this big. It's super thick. Oh my God, like you, no joke. Uh, I have not tried a halibut cheek before, but yeah, awesome. So there was one time we went to the Santa Barbara fishery um, or fish market, and they had a giant sea bass there and they had flayed it up and they had all the flays and there's just the head there and the head didn't, they usually are really good about taking the cheeks out and the cheeks were still in it. So, um, we got, we got access to that. That was like, it was incredible. Um, so cheeks, yeah, cheeks, cheeks, cheeks. Um, so this is the main thing, right? And so I think a lot of it is having these sustainable practices in mind. We're advancing in our aquaculture and our mariculture, which is reducing some of the pressures. But um, each state is kind of, you know, has their own regulations. California is, has really improved on their regulations, which is why we're seeing a lot of our fisheries come back. It's very much science-based. I'm not the biggest fan of, of cow fish and wildlife when it comes to like you know, getting permits and stuff like that to do research. It's like the biggest hassle in the world. It's really difficult to get them on the phone or or contact them. Um, you, you know, I think all of us have like our person or two in fish and wildlife that we go to and we, we, we talk to if we need anything. Um, but they are doing a much better job now at regulating a lot of our fisheries, which is why we're seeing a rebound. Um, they're the main agency that's doing the regulations. And so there are a lot of, you know, um, federal state agencies that help out with, with research, lots of, of academics, right. And in various institutions, NGOs, nonprofits that, um, are all, you know, vested fishers, right. The, the fishing organization itself helps out with this too, but, Cal Fish and Wildlife are the regulators for that. And so they're the ones that have, um, you know, officers out in boats that are, that are, um, you know, monitoring the Channel Islands or the coast. Most major harbors where you get the wreck boats coming in will have an officer there and they'll check your, your um, ice chest when you're coming in. So they never check you going out. 
they'll check you coming in and they'll ask for your permit and then they'll ask to see all your fish. One thing that used to be a way to get around that is everyone would stop before they get in the harbor and they fillet all their fish, right? They're going to fillet all their fish. So oh, they'll never know I took an undersized fish because I'm just filleting it. I'll cut it up into quarters and stuff like that. Can't do that anymore. So if you do fillet your fish, you have to fillet, you have to only have the whole fish and you have to keep a piece of the skin on it so they can identify the fish now. So a lot of times too, they would fillet and they take the skin off and they say, oh no, this isn't a yellowtail or this isn't a halibut, this is a sheephead or whatever. And they try to get around it, can't do that anymore. So um, they've definitely advanced and, and I would say that they are a lot more present um, I think a lot of people that try to manipulate the system are always weary about going in, especially like on busy, usually like if you go to a harbor Fridays through Sundays is when most of the boats are in the water. That's where most of the enforcement is. Um, lots of jobs here too. So actually they have um, a part-time position that they're always looking for, for people to help out. You'd be stationed at one of the harbors. And so you sit there with a board They'll give you a board and and a, a check sheet, um, and they go and they talk to all the fishers when they come in. So they can't regulate. So you are not a regulator. You cannot be an enforcer. It's it's purely voluntary. So you're asking them, "Hey, we're taking a poll. We want to see what you caught. You know, would you mind sharing with us?" You don't have to show. They don't. Sh so they're not putting you in a position where you're, you know, having to do enforcement or someone could retaliate on you. It's would you mind, you know, helping us out? So do you have a fishing license? Yes or no? What did you catch? You don't even have to show them. They'll ask, but they're, you know, they pay like 20 bucks an hour to basically sit in your car. Most of them just sit in their car, wait for a boat to come in. They go out and they're talking to fishers. But if you're interested in in working for the agency, it's a great way to get into the agency. Um I think it's part time, but I I think especially during fishing season, you could easily get full time hours for summertime stuff. Um, these are the types of management scenarios that California uses. That is is I wouldn't say unique to California, but it, because we have so many different kinds, it's what's working. Um, so the first one is easy: it's size and bag limits. Most fish that that we have have size or bag limits. So um, for um, this is a, a sand bass, but all basses, calico bass, sand bass, barred sand bass, they have to be 14 inches. Um, and so this was recently changed from 12 to 14. And what happened just with that year, it, you don't see a huge difference. You probably get more meat out of it because that extra year they'll fatten up, but it gives them one extra year of reproduction. So those females specifically that are going from the 12 inch to 14, which is about two years old to three years old, can produce more eggs. So there's more eggs distributed on the reef, more fertilization occurring. So it's completely rebounded the entire fishery. And so that's where, you know, they're going out, they have all these size regulations. They're seeing that the, the, um, the fishery is crashing. What happens if we give them one more year? How big are they on average one more year? So one more year gives them like three or four different reproductive periods. They'll reproduce about four times a year. So now having all those extra eggs, what does it do on the reef? Totally rebounded. Um, and then rockfish. This is a vermilion rockfish. Most rockfish that you have in restaurants and stuff are probably vermilions or similar to vermilions. Delicious. Very, very good. These are deep water. So a lot of them are... 400, 500 down to like 800 feet, uh, which is why they're they're deep red. These have uh, no size limits on these. You could keep ones that are this big if you want to. Um, a lot of times people do because when you're reeling them up from 800 feet, their gas bladders will come out of their mouths. They kind of explode. Their eyes will explode. So they're most cases they're not going to survive. Sometimes if you fish in like 200 feet of water, 300 feet of water. You can depressure them and then you can send them back down. So we have these, these um, it's a, it's like a little clamp. It's a tension clamp. You put it on their lip and it's, it has a weight. So you drop them all the way down. And once it hits the bottom, you just tug it and it opens up the clamp. And so you're able to send them back down. You can usually do that for about two or 300 foot. If you're catching them in seven or 800, you're eating or feeding them to the seagulls. Um, or whatever uh, sea, sea lion is cruising around. These all have bag limits. You're allowed five of these a day. 
no more, all species. So it could be five calicos, it could be five bards, it could be three and two, you're only allowed five. Rockfish, you can have 10. And so different fisheries, there's a tons of different species of rockfish. Um, one of my favorite uh, families of fishes. They're 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 really beautiful. They're um, we have many different species along the coast. There are a few that are endangered. Um, that they so this is why if you get a fishing license, you need to read the manual because if you catch one of those and you take it home, like it's it's not just a fine. Um, it, it could be jail time. Um, usually, if it's your first time doing it, you'll get a hefty fine. If you do it a couple times, you're going to jail. Um, but a lot of um, folks, um, you know, there's there's a diver that was in La Jolla Cove. Um, man, when was that? That was probably like eight, ten years ago. Spear fisherman and um, shot a giant sea bass, pulled it up on shore. Didn't know the regulations. Didn't I, I think he he thought it was a a grouper, which is still you can't take, but it's not federally. It's it's not. Um, state protected and he went to jail. I think he went to jail for like six months and he had like a $5,000 fine or something like that. So it's really important um, to, to know your regulations. And total though, for the state, depends, doesn't matter what you're catching, you're allowed 20 fish a day. So if it's, I catch five of these and 10 of these, I can catch five other fish, I'm cut off at 20. So you have to choose what 20 fish you want. Um, every fish has, uh, most fish have a, a, some kind of size or, or count limit, but in general for the state, that's it's 20. Things that don't count are like this, the, the bait. So if you want to take home your anchovies, your mackerel, your sardines, things that you're using for bait, squid, don't count. These are what we call, these are called ground fish. Yeah. Thanks. Good, quick, cool. Um, other things like bluefin tuna, we'll talk about bluefin. Um, I, I do not eat bluefin unless I catch it. Um, one of the most, you know, endangered fish species that we have, especially in the commercial ones, um, commercial industry. Um, so every time you go to a restaurant and you're looking at that menu and you want that piece of Toro or you want that spicy tuna roll, just know that you know what Dan Barber was saying too, about 90% or more of that stock has been depleted for the whole world. And so, um, especially the larger ones, we have a very sustainable bluefin fishery that's found in, in California. It's because we're only allowed to take two a day and most of ours are transient species. So we only get them for about a month and we don't have a commercial fishery. So you can't go out and like wrangle a bunch of bluefin that are out here, which is different for the rest of the world. But for me, I'll go out and if I catch one bluefin that's 20 pounds, that's all I'll need for the day. Um, and that will be what I eat, but I won't buy them in the stores. Um, that's kind of a, a hard line that I've, I've taken for myself. Um, I have a few of them that I, I'll share. Um, seasonal closures. So uh, a lot of species have seasonal closures. The bass that we were talking about don't, you can fish them year round. Um, rockfish have a seasonal closure. This is a boccaccio. This was one fish species that was heavily fished and um, collapsed in the, the late 90s, early 2000s. You can only take two of these um, a day. Um, and that goes towards your 20 total count. It goes towards two of your 10 of rockfish. So there's lots of math involved knowing your species. Dungeness crab have a, a season. This is very much kind of you've watched deadliest catch, right? Like they have these quotas where it's like a, a specific window they can go out and you have to get permits. So it depends on the number of fishermen, fishers that are, are fishing them. So that they regulate the number of traps that are going out and there's a season for Dungeness crab because it's the second um, largest fishery that we have. Market value, lobsters, right? Lobster season um, started in October. Last week of October, it'll go to March. And so right now, if you wanted to, you don't even need gear. You need a wetsuit and snorkel gear, and you can go out to Leo Carrillo or other rocky reefs, and you could get lobster. Simon just went out um, a few days ago, just south of, of Leo Carrillo, and he got, he got six bugs in one day. So um, one of them was a hunker, too. So like this is all accessible to you. Um, MPAs. 
We talked a little bit about MPs with Dr. A. So a lot of the, the focus with these is to designate these zones where these fisheries are restricted for and and a lot of these zones that were that were chosen, especially for fisheries purposes, were areas that there were you know good habitat where where certain species of fish could reproduce, and with the goal of them getting to that increased size, right? You want them to get older so they can they're larger, they can produce more more gametes, particularly eggs. Eggs are expensive, sperm's cheap, right? Like so, we want more eggs on the reef. One male can fertilize many eggs, but it's really getting the 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 eggs on the reef. We call those boffs. Well, there's two there's fecund, yeah. Big old fecund females. All right. So we want big old fecund females on the reef because the 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 focus so their mature age this is a that's a ichthyology fishing term big old fecund females boss um those are the ones that that bring back these fisheries right that maintain fisheries if you have one rockfish that's 30 years old rockfish can live up to 80 years old like so that vermilion rockfish could live up to like 80 if you have a really old one that's 40, 50 years, so they're still fecund, they're still producing tons of eggs, that one female could just regenerate a whole reef. Like so, but it's hard if you have fishing pressure on that reef and all of these trophy fishers that want to get that and they want to take that photo, right? They want to flay that up and take it home. Like by removing that fish, you've just did a huge detriment to that reef. So another thing as that I appreciate that, you know, I've, I've learned over the years where I have that fishing side of me where it's like, yeah, I want to catch the big ones, of course. Um, but the ecological side of me is like, I can't take this home. Right? So if I catch a big, if I catch a boff, I'm throwing that boff back, back, right? Like that's not the one that I'm going to be taking home because that's going to be feeding me for many generations, if I keep coming to this reef, just having that one female um, thrown back. And so that's kind of the purpose of that. And then you have the spillover. So if you have a few of these older fish that are producing tons of eggs, like those eggs have to go somewhere. And the reef can only handle so much productivity of fish, biomass of fish. So then they're going to start spilling out, right? And so all the reefs that are outside of that MPA that's protected now have tons of fresh fish consistently. And that's what the fishers are fishing. So a lot of times you'll actually, especially go to the islands, you'll see all the fishing boats. They're right on the edge of the MPAs. So they're not in it. So it's legal to, to fish there, but they're getting all that spillover from the MPAs, which is a huge fisheries management, like, like um, success story for, for California. Quotas and catch limits. Um, halibut is, is one of these, there used to be kind of like a derby style, um, um, fishing for, for halibut that has changed. Um, and now you can take two of these a day. They have to have, they have to be, uh, 22 inches. Um, you can catch these in the surf. So like you can just get one fishing pole and just go to a local beach and just cast in the waves and you can catch halibut. Um, and like super tasty, right? Like um, this this fishery has rebounded incredible. Um, but the purpose of of the quota or catch limits is to limit the total allowable catch, right? In a given season, um, and so it's really preventing um, overfishing, overfishing, ensuring long term stock assessments. They can change this. So a lot of the fish that fall into this quota or catch limits it's very much like deadliest catch, right? Where like every year these these fishers are, are waiting for their quota. Okay, what's our quota poundage, right? right. Halibut hasn't really changed much because the the two a day and, and the size limits has helped it, but they, they reassess every single year to say, are we gonna keep this quota? Are we gonna keep this assessment? Or are we gonna change it? Rockfish are like this too, some rockfish. Um, you have your gear restrictions. So they've they've changed gear restrictions a lot over these. We're going to go more uh, on into detail with with gear uh, next Tuesday. 
Um, but this is to minimize the bycatch, like Willow was asking. So really the unintentional catch of any target species, marine mammals, birds. We don't really get sea turtles here much. We'll get them down in San Diego a little bit. Um, but it just reduces a lot of the environmental impacts. Um, the big ones were changes in our gill nets. So gill nets are these large stretches. They can go, you know, football fields longer than that, where they are just floating out in the, the open ocean. And so there, there's nothing attaching them to the bottom. They are just floats and they're waiting for larger fish, like, you know, a lot of the, the, the transient species, the, the swordfish, the yellowtail, tunas, things like that, um, to just cruise through and they get stuck in them. Um, this is where a lot of your marine mammals get stuck in here. A lot of your um, giant sea bass, things like that. So, so there's been heavy restrictions on these. There's certain zones that you could still use them, but not not many. And then like these otter trawls or large trawl nets, right? Scraping the ocean bottom. Um, there's restrictions on those in certain areas as well. Um, any questions on that? Gear restrictions. Um, the catch shares and permitting systems. So there are some for ground fish. When I say ground fish, these are like typically, you know, what it says, they're, they're fish that are found on the ocean floor. These are your rock fish. Um, this crazy looking thing is a lingcod. So if you've had lingcod before, it's really tasty. They're, they're voracious predators. Their meat is blue. So if you fillet it, it's like, a, it's, it's like this color. It's kind of trippy when you eat it, but uh, super, super good. I had a Thanksgiving a couple of years ago. I went to my aunt's house and I caught a lingcod the, the the day before. So instead of having like the pig with the apple in it, I I cooked the whole lingcod and I I put a big apple in its mouth and it was a it was a success. Everyone loved it. Um, it was people were very hesitant to start like jumping in and getting some because like the teeth were just like like fully out, but super tasty but this is a way that that we can kind of i'm going to talk about the cooperative management that that happens a lot in mexico which i think is really great this is as close to kind of a co-op that we have so there are the areas of the coast particularly up north where you have these like catch shares and these these like co-ops where they'll get specific portions of the of the catch um, and so it's really like a community-based way of, of, of incent incentivizing sustainable practices. Everyone kind of shares in um, this fishery. I wish we had more of these, um, but it's, it's hard, especially with, with you know, the politics of California, the, 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 as long of a coast that we have, different areas, it's hard to manage these types of quota systems. Um, but it does kind of the goal is to reduce competition and just, you know, everybody that's collectively bought in. So you'd buy into shares or quotas, everyone shares in, in the profits of it. Um, and then there's um, certain monitoring and reporting requirements. If you go and you want to catch a lobster, so you have to have your fishing license, fresh water. So the standard one's fresh water. You have to buy the ocean enhancement stamp, which is 15 bucks. So that means now you can fish in the ocean. And then you have to buy a California spiny lobster tag, which I think is six extra dollars. When you get this, they actually send you a form. And so every single lobster you catch, if I go out and I catch like fish when I'm catching all my like calico bass or whatever, I don't have to report that. I just have to stay within the limits and I can bring them home and, and nobody knows how many I caught. If you go on a wreck boat, they very roughly we'll give estimates to fish and wildlife saying we caught about 500 calicos we've caught about like like 15 halibut and about that it's not like really accurate um but with lobster it's super accurate if you get the license you have to you have to sign that you will send it back if you don't catch a single lobster you still have to send it back saying i didn't catch a lobster but every single lobster you catch you have to measure it and you have to write it down on this list and you have to send it back after lobster season. So they have a very accurate assessment of what the lobster fishery is throughout California, which is really great. 
Um, they used to do this with abalone. Abalone, there's no fishery anymore. That's on a moratorium right now. So you, there used to be small seasons with abalone. You'd have the same thing. You'd have to record how many you got. That's um, that's no longer, and I I don't see that changing anytime soon. Hopefully down the road. Um, and then salmon or or steelhead. This is a steelhead. And so if you go and collect steelhead locally there we have steelhead in like malibu and stuff right you can't fish for those in northern california in the major rivers you can go and catch steelhead um the um the uh like the trinity river the snake river um all have them you have to send that into you have this how many you caught and and what the the size was and then this adaptive management scenario. So Fish and Wildlife has been a lot better with this. They're growing. I, I I hope they continue to do it. But they realize that we can't just, you know, have this regulation. So let's, for example, go back to that Calico Bass where it's like, we're going to change from 12 to 14. Okay, it works. Not think about it again, right? They realize that the fishing pressure is going to continue to grow. There's still going to be climate impacts. They're going to change the distribution of fisheries. The, the resources, right, the, the, the amount of food availability for them might change. So they need to be able to adapt each season. And so they build in these adaptive management scenarios. It basically allows them to reassess every year. And if they have to pull back, they can. They're probably not going to add. But if they need to, they'll pull back. And so they're doing this with anchovies and sardines makes sense, right? Like this is the major driver of the food chain. So you'd want adaptive management strategies for, for these types of bait fish. A lot of the species that are federally protected, salmon, salmonids, are, um, have adaptive management scenarios too. They can just shut off the salmon fishery if they, if they need to. Um, it would be huge backlash, but they can do it. Um, mostly because most salmon are federally protected. So if you actually look at the Endangered Species Act, like the out of the top 10 species that like get the most funding every single year, which are which are tens of millions of dollars every single year, eight of them are salmonids. King salmon, Chinook salmon, you know, sockeye salmon, you name it, they're all salmon. Um, because it's a huge resource for for many um, people communities. Um, and then you have this community stakeholder involvement, which is which is um, various species. The the big one is the is the white sea bass. If you go to um, the boating center, right across the way from the boating center is a white sea bass pen. So they start grow. They've grown white sea bass and they um, distribute distribute them out to the ocean. They'll release them. I don't think it's the biggest success story. I think what ends up happening because they release them when they're about this big and they release them in the harbor, all the seals and the sea lions have learned about this. So they wait outside the pen and then they eat most of them. Um, but, you know, they check the genetics of a lot of the, the larger ones that, um, you know, white sea bass can get 90 plus pounds. So they, the ones that are getting caught, they'll check the genetics and they see if any of them have the, um, the the kind of aquaculture or the the um the cultured ones genetics and most of them don't so they're not really coming from those pens they're 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 natural which is great for the fishery they're like wild caught ones that are that are reproducing but but not so much the um the ones that are in the pens however it's built this community of fishers, the community around it, scientists, conservationists that have all kind of collectively bought into the stakeholder involvement with this fishery because they wanted to um, increase the, fisher, the, the fishery. This one nearly collapsed as well in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and it's, it's come back quite well. This year was an incredible year for white sea bass and halibut. Um, I'll... Um, I'll we could watch this video next week because we'll talk about it. The last one I want to talk about um, are these cooperative fisheries in in Mexico. And so if you've been to, who's been down to Mexico and like Baja area, not many, some of you, cool. So um, I really, I really love Baja. I, I, I usually go down there about every other year we do a big fishing trip. Um, the the community is is amazing. The the fishers are incredible. Um, 
one of the things that I, I I've kind of come around to, I've, I've thought a lot about, but there are these, you know, universal languages for, for humans. Right. And so if you think about universal languages, music, right, is kind of a universal language. It kind of transcends native, native language and, and um, people can communicate through that art math is a universal language i think some people even say like latin is because most of our languages now are based off of latin fishing is a universal language and so whenever i go down and i'm talking to people down in baja and i can speak a little spanish not much um, i can get by when i'm down it when i'm in the polynesia and i'm i'm working with um, folks in in morea and, and tahiti like we don't we're not talking like we don't get what each other are saying we can talk about fishing easily like there's just this communal language about fishing that works and like i love spending time with the the fishers down in in mexico they're amazing they 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 know their their natural resources and they're very much local right so they're all very close to wherever they are living they're utilizing the coastline near where they live, right? They don't have the resources to just drive up and down the Baja coast like we do when we go in down there, but they know their area really well. A lot of areas, one area in particular that I went a few years ago, Baja Asuncion, which is, which is like Southern Baja, they have these cooperative fisheries management areas. And so the cooperative there is based off of lobster. And so it's it's the partnership of the entire community. They know that this community, which you have to drive 40 minutes out of Asuncion to just get ice and, and groceries and things like that, right? So they're off the grid. Very little Wi-Fi, very little, you know, like water, electricity, mostly solar panels, wells. Um, they know that the biggest resource for them, for the entire community, is the lobster that are found on this one point on this, like the edge of this reef. And there's a shit ton of lobster. Like you, and you go down, you snorkel, and it's just lobster for days, right? So they go out and they sustainably harvest this lobster fishery. They have a co-op there, a cooperative, where they take it to this market, they process them, they ship them all around the world. Most of the trucks and everything that are coming into Asuncion is to is our freezer trucks that are getting these and taking them to the local airport or wherever they're distributed. You do not f with the lobster at Baja Asuncion, and so like people go there, it's great fishing. We went down there, yellowtail, um, grouper, things like that. You have to ask special permission to have a lobster there, right? And it's usually like building that community. So. They, they don't see a lot of people. So every time we go down there, they're coming over. They have dried yellowtail. They'll teach us how they're, they they grill their yellowtail or whatever. You, you know, we have one or two beers maybe um, with them, maybe. Um, but you're building that relationship. A lot of us, we we don't understand each other language-wise, but we're talking about fishing. We're, we're building this camaraderie. They bring over lobster. It's really great. But then you hear stories about people that have effed with the lobster there. Nobody has seen them ever again, right? It's that important to them um, and they govern themselves. And so um, there, you know, there, there's these different stakeholders. So it's found a lot throughout Baja. There's parts of um, South America, Central America too, where the, the coordination of it's different. For this, it's one community, small town that's collectively bought in. That's where most of the jobs and resources are. It's either that or recreation. And they all share it. Um, there is some government oversight because there's an MPA close by it. I think that's where a lot of the spillover of the lobsters come in. So there, you can see the patrol boats cruising through. This is a patrol boat right here. These are all pangas. So most of their fishing, you would think that like massive lobster industry they're pulling out tons of lobster they have lobster traps all over they're all doing it out of these small pongas right and so there's lots of them out there they're all collectively bought in there's patrol um and these patrols are different right these these aren't like when you're going down and and you're talking to the policia down there at the border like these are kind of scientists like they they they're they're um oversight their enforcement that but they have a, a background they're very much 
they live in the community they're protecting the reef it's really awesome um and you know it's it's they have these mpas and social networks that they seem to work really well that works for a small community so i could see that maybe working for like a tamales bay with like the oysters if they wanted to do it right this is really difficult for a large state like california to enforce there are stretches of central california i'll give you some examples maybe next week where there's just individual landowners that have stretches of beach and they actually say like this is your beach to to fish and they're pretty far away but they're but that person manages it or that family manages it but then all of those so one person might have like the lobster reef next to it another person might have like fishing another person might have kelp or something like that all of those go into like a big farmer's market where they're collectively managing and trading and then figuring out what goes out so these co-ops are really interesting definitely a smaller scale but they seem to work um it definitely helps with like the um, the environmental impacts. So these are some of the benefits, improve compliance and enforcement. It's a small area. So they, it's a lot easier to enforce those areas, right? Instead of having like the channel islands that you have to like manage, it's pretty, pretty um, large distance. Enhanced data collection, They're, all of their, their data is being collected on one reef. So it makes it a lot easier. Responsibility and accountability. Everyone is collectively bought in. Um, it's provided economic stability, at least now, as long as they manage it well, and there's always a lobster fishery, that that small town will have some kind of economic stability. And then there's definitely an environmental stability. Limitations, potential for conflict. You never know with the stakeholders and things like that, um, or people that are community leaders and things like that, how that can change, because it's it's one resource that is as drives a lot of of the governance of the of that community um management complexity one thing that they don't really have which at least the last time i was out there and i was talking to them they don't really have that adaptive management strategy so they're not thinking okay what's going to happen five ten years from now when we have climate change or what's going to happen if some you know disease comes through with lobster they don't they haven't really gotten that point yet um enforcement challenges sometimes can be difficult for them they they um they had quite a presence of of enforcement and then their their local knowledge was incredible one of the papers that i put up on um canvas that you should read which i thought was really 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 interesting and i wish was around when that whole mpa network was was being talked about in in the hearings was um um the there was an abalone um the a survey so they went down to mexico and they surveyed all the the fishers and app that that harvested abalone and they wanted to know because a lot of the data wasn't recorded so there was this crash of abalone and they didn't have any data for it and when they actually went through and they talked to the fishers their knowledge of just the time frame of when these these ecological collapses happened and when these abalone crashes happened coincided with all the findings that the scientists had um that you know had supported similar things but but it goes to show you that these fishers that are out there every single day part of their livelihood even though they don't have bs degrees or any degree whatsoever they're the ones out there and they know the trends they know they're seeing it oh yeah that's this year is when the year that you know we didn't see as many abalone or this was the warm year and and we got this algae bloom and you know we didn't have a lot of reproduction of this and so it was like highly correlated. Fisher knowledge was highly correlated with these ecological trends, which is which is really interesting. Um, this is the the um, example I just talked to you about, about the lobster fishery. This is the um, the cooperative out there. It's pretty great. Everyone's really awesome. And so they also do a lot of fishing too. So they they'll collect fish, and and that's what they they take to their fish markets, and usually feeds the community. Most of them, they say, do not eat lobster. So the lobster is caught, it goes to the cooperative, that's what pays their bills. So they won't even eat the lobster. They eat all the other kind of resources that are there. Um, this is the last little video that kind of talks about some of this artisanal fisheries, is co-op fisheries. And then um, that's it for the lecture part of today. Uh, you like to do you copy. Mm -hmm.
joining the Sea Legacy team here in Baja. Good to see you, man. Good to see you, man. Thanks for coming. They've already been here filming natural history, wildlife, and I'm here to tell the other aspects of the story. The Biosphere Reserve is a proposed marine protection plan in Baja Sui. It's meant to regulate and push out industrial fishing fleets, and it's meant to benefit artisanal fishing communities. Mario's just beginning to propose the idea. It's not created yet, so fight is just beginning. <laughs> Really powerful storytelling journalism. I think that that's getting into the world to care. We show the fishermen because they're part of the story now. And I think that the fishermen and the people that have the most to gain or the most to lose in these stories are underrepresented. For, for the success of something like this, it comes down to a handful of leaders in each community. You have two levels of fishing you've got the big industrial commercial fishing, you've got the small artisanal fisheries. One is wiping out the opportunity for the other. Mario Gomez is perhaps the most connected man in all of all when it comes to ocean conservation work. We had a meeting with uh, some of the people from the fishing community, the artisanal fishermen. They were making a lot of complaints against the creation of the reserve because they are going to be affected. The idea is that it is wrong. There's a lot of misinformation. They have no trust for anyone. There is like a karma amongst them. They don't even know what it's underneath the ocean. So it's very difficult to ask them to start working together to ask for the benefit of the doubt. Too often, you know, there's a, there's a good guy and a bad guy. And the fishermen have been the bad guy for too long. So this is kind of happening at the tip of Baja, or throughout Baja California Sur, where there aren't those co-ops where they're trying to create that type of cooperative and it's kind of unpoliced coastal areas where anyone can take whatever they want the broad picture of the story give voices to all the community members here that would be affected and benefit from a biosphere reserve Y vivo en Aguamarga y soy pescador. Tengo prácticamente 30 años dedicándome a la pesca. Tengo 47 años. Es lo que hacemos, lo que nos enseñaron nuestros padres. Simple y sencillamente es nuestro trabajo, nuestra forma de vivir. No es un negocio grande. Simple y sencillamente es para nuestra familia y para sacar para vivir. El mar. Es mi vida, es mi casa, es mi oficina, mi trabajo. Primero por diversión, luego por aprender y ahora porque lo disfruto es parte de mi vida. Cuando no estoy en él, empiezo a buscar la manera de ir allá. Y hemos dependido del mar para poder salir adelante, para alimentarnos, para sacar a nuestras familias adelante. Cuando en la época de mi, de mi papá, en la época de mi abuelo, había mucho más de todo. Ahora, pues, ya vemos a todos. Y, pues, cada día hay más barco y, pues, también hay más pescador. We can see how fragile the ecosystem is. It's not the same. And it's a big, big change. Hard situation. Años atrás, la diversidad en las especies, la pesca que nosotros hacíamos era en grandes volúmenes, había mucha, mucho que pescar. Tiempo actual y vemos que desgraciadamente las especies han disminuido el número, pero también sabemos que no es el pescador artesanal. It's 13 degrees Celsius. It's freezing cold. These guys go down on duca mines for like three or four hours at a time. But, you know, it's also beautiful. 
and they seem really happy. And that's the life. That's the life. Tenemos un gran problema aquí, que es la pesca industrial, que realmente depreda nuestra zona, o sea, no respetan tallas, no respetan especies, este, no respetan volúmenes. The canals, the fish, swim, ecosystem, it's not the same. And now we have a hard time to keep our boats, our equipment in good condition. And we are not making enough, you know? This big industrial fishing fleets that come in the Gulf of California. And the fishermen have told me they can take as much fish in one night as these communities fish in an entire year of fishing. It's unsustainable. They're starting to hurt the economy. If we can work with the local artisanal fishermen and protect wildlife and nature, this entire area, through their needs, through their future, of survival, then we really have a chance to protect all of us. So I think the the goal for that, um, or the the push for that, is like he was saying. There's there's a lot of these commercial fishing boats that are coming into these unpoliced areas, and they're they're taking up most of the resources. But they've been finding that a lot of these kind of local cooperative management areas that that are established have been working really well and i think baja if you know baja going down it's it's a lot of these kind of small communities that are distributed through baja and so giving that those stretches of coast having one big protected area for baja sewer but then you could give the communities this collective buy-in it's hard to sell them on it if they haven't done it yet but what they found and it's the same thing here right there was the collective buy-in about the mpas but now you go talk to to any fisher and they're like yeah the mpas are working you know it's 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 helping them out so that's kind of the the goal for that um i think what we'll do because it went a little bit longer than i thought which is totally cool i think we'll do the data thing next week but we'll end since it's getting close to lunchtime is we're gonna do um where's my we're gonna do a little menu and so I want everyone to kind of choose. This is, um, let me go full screen on this. Yep. So has anyone eaten at sugarfish before? Sugarfish is c common. Like it's a, it's a chain now. Come a lot in LA. I think there's one in Ventura. If you go to their website, all they talk about is sustainable seafood and how they have sustainable seafood and they value sustainable seafood. And so they have this whole thing with, you know, their different meals, which is, um, you know, I think it's super funny that they highlight them this way, which is trust me, right? So this is the trust me package. You're trusting me. It's it's incredible. If you go, if you have your computers, go to sugarfish.com. And it's just like, you would think that they work with like the Monterey Bay Seafood Watch program or something like that. Um, so trust me. And then trust me light. And then the Nozawa, trust me. And so the first thing on it is, once you get past edamame, is tuna sashimi. It's unsustainable. There's no sustainable tuna. Like there's 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 better practices for it, but the the tuna fisheries like you can't have it. And that tuna is toro, which is bluefin, which is unsustainable. There's no sustainable fishery for it. Um, albacore is one of the better options, but still unsustainable. Salmon, they don't tell you what type of salmon. Um, and so my my goal, my things for you today, just for what I practice, if the, if there's three things that you think about next time you go to any seafood restaurant, other than asking like where things are, are brought, I am that person that is the annoying person at the table saying, where's that salmon from? Where is this from? You should know where your food comes from. Um, don't eat tuna. Find something else. There's so many other things that you can eat 
besides a spicy tuna roll or whatever roll. Um, tuna is unsustainable. If you are going to eat tuna, you have to have tuna eat albacore. Albacore is most of it, especially um, what you find in um, California. Um, most of our restaurants, it's long line fishing, which is which is like the the less impactful practice of it. Yellowfin, bluefin, do not eat. I've cut it out of my diet unless I, I catch one a year for myself or your friend brings 180 pounds and needs to give it away and I'll, I'll eat that. Um, the other thing is salmon. I love salmon. You should not eat farm-raised salmon. All farm-raised salmon is unsustainable to date. So the thing with salmon uh, farms is they the high polluters so it just creates a lot of waste they have to distribute that waste somewhere salmon are fresh water right so most of the time they're actually you know they don't always make it into the ocean right they'll they'll discharge it into a river or some kind of watershed or they'll to, um, you know get a lot of the waste and discharge it onto land and it's not really used for a lot of sustainable practices i think they're trying to work on that but it's very unsustainable or Atlantic salmon. So most of like the locks that you get at, at the market or whatever, it's Nova Scotia, unsustainable salmon fisheries. If you're going to eat salmon, Pacific Northwest, if it's from Alaska, if it's from Washington, if it's from Oregon, it's sustainable fisheries. You might have to pay an extra dollar for those lock packages. They still have them at, at all your markets. They're not that much expensive difference between a totally sustainable fishery and a very unsustainable ecologically impacted fishery. And then the last one probably will make a lot of people upset is don't eat shrimp. There's a few shrimp on the planet that are sustainable. Um, you're not finding them in most markets. Um, they, and if they, if you do see them, they will advertise the shit out of them because they cost a lot of money. There's a couple shrimp. There's like the, 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 uh, Mexican shrimp, actually the Mexican white shrimp is actually pretty sustainable. We don't really get them here. It's hard to get. Um, there's one sustainable, um, farm that's actually based in Irvine. That's, that has like really sustainable practices. They're, they're a, a, big part like parking lot like they can't produce that much so it's hard to get them there are a few prawns so you can look and see what type of prawns but shrimp cut them out so for, if you have like shrimp tacos or whatever shrimp linguine they're getting the shitty shrimp anyways because they're smothering it with sauce and all that other stuff it's not sustainable so if you could actually change this aspect of your seafood experience you can do a huge amount of benefits for the for fisheries, but also just knowing what you're eating, right? So Toro hand roll, unsustainable. Salmon, I'm not sure where it came from. Yeah. Just like sustainable, just like changing their population. So it depends. So like with tuna, with Toro, it's it's ninety percent of the the um, tuna, especially bluefin, has been, um, you know taken right so it's 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 essentially crashed and and um a lot of the practices have improved but you still don't know where you're getting your tuna so there are still a lot of unsustainable practices for tuna but it's mostly because of the the amount of fish that are out there they've just been overfished salmon is not necessarily a lot of the like there's salmon out there but it's if farm raised salmon, especially, it's the waste that it produces for to the environment. So it's the ecological impact. Nova Scotia and Atlantic salmon have been heavily outfished. So their their numbers have, have dropped a lot. Toro, unsustainable. Yellowtail, pretty sustainable. You can have yellowtail, that's that's doable. New Zealand sea bream, unsustainable. If you go on a seafood watch, it'll probably come up as unsustainable. Sea bass, it doesn't tell you what kind it is. It's probably not white sea bass. And then crab, who knows what it's in. But most of these things are unsustainable or they're not giving you a lot of information to make sustainable choices, even though you're supposed to trust them. Right? You're to trust me, trust me, trust me. So take a few minutes, look at this menu, choose three things that you think, now that you have that, would be sustainable. That's not like a Diet Coke or anything. Like actual, like, like fish. 
not not any anamami or anything like that but choose let's just go to the main menu there we go choose three things Yeah, you guys do that. I just want to sort of get ready for our next uh, exercise. Uh, Jordy, uh, I'll start with Jordy. Oh, oh, oh. Some of you guys told me. Oh, I know. Uh, Angelina. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Alex. Laura. Uh, Emily. Okay. Uh, Jacob. Ventura. Okay. Uh, like where you live at right now? Yeah. Carson. Uh, Carson. Uh, Jason. Uh, Los Angeles. Yeah. Thanks. All right. What do you think? Scallops. So these are all, okay, I'm getting hungry. So oysters, for the most part, are pretty sustainable, especially if you can get them from California or like Mexico, some in Hawaii. The other thing to think about too, which for me, it's it's definitely something I consider, but mostly for me, it's it's the stock assessments and then like the practices, and then it's like where it's coming from. So am I going to spend, you know, ten dollars to ship something from new zealand all the way here to eat when i can eat something that's equally delicious like an oyster from tamales bay right so a lot of times if you go to an oyster bar they'll give you like three four or five options choose the one from washington choose the one from california choose the one from mexico there's probably going to be ones from hawaii there's probably going to be ones and you don't think that that's going to make a huge difference, but like the more educated we are and, and those decisions go into how we're ordering, if people are ordering less of the ones from from New Zealand, then that restaurant's not going to buy the ones from New Zealand anymore, right? If they see that the Tamales Bay ones are popular, they're going to buy more Tamales Bay ones. So your, your you know choice does actually matter and it influences what they purchase. So scallops is, is or um, sorry, oysters is a good one. Scallops is interesting. So it depends on where they come from. And a lot of, and that's going to be the answer to most of this, but a lot of scallops are actually really unsustainable. So um, if you get scallops that um, are from California, then they're pretty sustainable, Mexico as well. But a lot of scallops that we get are um, from Japan or or from, you know, Asian countries, um, that kind of um, Western Pacific, and um, they're really small. So the thing to look at is if you see, if you're looking at the plate over, like on the, and you see like a bunch of small scallops, they're like this big, don't buy them. But if they're larger scallops, then then they're usually sustainable. What were the other things that unagi? Um, lo lobster. It depends on where it came from. So if it's California spiny lobster, then yes. If it's like a tropical lobster or if it's a Maine lobster, no, they're not. Um, unagi is, what is unagi again? Eel. eel, that's right. Eel is not sustainable. So no eel is really sustainable. Um, yeah, right. I'm just like I'm just like squashing your dreams of your next sushi. Catfish. No, so no. This this is I'm I'm using this as a point. I've always thought like every time I teach this class, I I go to the point where I've always wanted to write an op ed and and call this business out. But now they've like grown and grown and grown. So who knows their power to just to smash the the scientist, the poor scientist. Um, but um. But this, as as much as they scream sustainability, most of the things on here are not sustainable or they're not giving you the information that you need to make sustainable choices. But you can go, there's many restaurants oops, that um, have um, sustainable food. So we go to this place called Sushi Enya 
I think there's three of them now. There's one in in uh, Marina del Rey, Santa Monica, on Washington. There's one over by our house, and I live in South Pasadena. Um, and I think there's one other one. They definitely have unsustainable options, but they have a ton of local stuff. And so one thing that's huge, if you ha has everyone seen or heard of the Seafood Watch app? So Monterey Bay Aquarium, they used to have these little cards. Um, close up. Um, so you can get the app on your phone. This is through the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And so basically everything on there, if you're at a restaurant, I always pull up my app and you're not even like sure what Kampachi is. It's, it's Jack. You can search it and it'll tell you whether it's best choice. So they rate it best choice, good alternative, good, good alternative. And you're looking for green, yellow, red. And so Kampachi is usually, and that was on the first menu, sustainable. Um, this is kind of like a yellowtail. So it's as close to a yellowtail as you'll get. Yellowtails are a type of jack, not a tuna. But you could do like Maine lobster. Or that's American lobster. Bad. Avoid. 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 And so when you're going through, you know, it's good to have those options so you know what type of of choices that you're making. Um, when I go here, this actually, what I love about this restaurant is it also offers a lot of different options other than your typical bluefin, eel, you know, yellowtail, whatever. So you actually start eat. I think the one thing that's scary for a lot of people is that, you know, you see octopus, you see uni, you see all these different things that you might not have, have eaten. And so you're just like, I'm not sure about that. So I'm just going to go with my spicy tuna roll or whatever that's comfortable. But once you actually start building a palate or just eat, like just being interested in different foods, now all of a sudden you go to the seafood and like, we're excited about trying new things. And it's less about actually having that um, sushi roll. So like halibut carpaccio, we asked them for all this stuff and, and most of their stuff's local, which is why we go back. Halibut, awesome. Octopus, sustainable. Um, their salmon is, is, is um, from the Pacific Northwest. You have to ask them for those. Um, I keep getting a close up on my face. Um, the what's the next one? So you have the sashimis. Once you get into the 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 actual like uh, nigiri, right? So that's like the the sashimi on top of the um, rice, like uni from Santa Barbara, super super um, sustainable. Um, kum, kuma moto oysters, sustainable. Um, live sweet shrimp, not sustainable. Um, but you can go through like caviar is not sustainable. Um, but you can start going through. If I see anything from Japan, um, I'm not going to buy it. And even if it's sustainable over there or not, like it's not worth me, get, you know, the processing and and the the carbon impact of of flying that over there's a lot of other really delicious options here um not the eel um that you can eat um and then kind of my favorite that i've started eating a lot of are these mackerel i think most people think of mackerel as this really fishy type of sardine anchovy type fish if you actually have fresh mackerel and it's prepped for sushi totally different flavor it's really, really, really delicious, super sustainable um, and, you know, caught locally. Yellowtail is sustainable. Kampachi, which is that amberjack, sustainable. Um, and so just think about, ooh, truffle halibut. Look at that. Um, think about that when you're like choosing seafood next, because there's just all these different decisions. It's not just the management decisions of how it's fished. It's not just the stock assessment, but it's also the processing and getting it to your food, which kind of creates that that different relationship. And if you ever want to learn how to fish, I'm always happy to take people out because um, it's it's such a great we have such a great resource on our coast that I don't think a lot of people actually take advantage of. Um, questions. Who's hungry? Um, that's all I have for today, Doctor. Do you have anything? 
Let's see. So this is, um, so we're starting to get into this stuff. And I know this is very confusing for a lot of us, these terms. Um, a, a lot of the, the you know, sushi, re sushi, uh, sushi restaurants use Japanese terms for yeah. words. We might use the Latin name. There's a common name. Um, uh, and many times there, the industry has changed the names intentionally to mislead you. And so uh, Patagonian toothfish, uh, you know, sounds kind of uh Sli maybe, slime you know, fish yeah yes it sounds, sounds kind of you know one way uh, uh anyway the point is um i we get there's there's a lot of confusion here and we, this is an ichthyology class so it gets it gets hard um uh we'll go over a lot of this stuff um but part of this is also what we're trying to convey right and so um as we start to transition into our next data collection exercise, where we're going to go to local markets and restaurants and just see what they have offering, right? The perspective that we're bringing to this is Joe Blow, random person off the street, right? We're not assuming someone has a PhD like Brendan or I that knows all the little ins and outs, but it's basically, hey, I want to get some seafood. What kind of seafood are they offering? We're just going to enumerate the seafood options. And then what information they have on the, on the can or whatever, or if we just ask really, you know, quickly the, the wait staff, hey, you know, it says fish tacos, what's the fish, right? Or, or, or where's the fish from? And they say like, you know, Tosco. Uh, like, yeah, <laughs> you know, so where is it from? Um, so, it's, so obviously we're gonna be getting data as part of the, another one of these things we've been doing for 20 years now, this, this looking at the options. But also this is a bit, um, it's a little bit with the polls, but it's really the case with this. The fact that you're asking something, I mean, we're collecting data and we're being objective, but it's actually turning you into someone who's um, quite honestly having some type of small, though it may be, but some type of influence on this. So there's, I remember there's been one market I do, a restaurant I do, whatever, and, I, and one of the questions we'll ask is, hey, how often do people ask about where your seafood comes from? I remember this one lady with relatively small restaurants, there wasn't that many weight said, uh, not very rarely. Really. Like, like how often, right? We're trying to quantify this. Is, is rarely mean like once a day, is rarely mean once a week, is rarely mean like, oh yeah, you yeah, know, maybe like once a year. So really. And it starts describing, and it was me the last year that I did, <laughs> right? And so and so um uh while many things we talk about, the plastic, you know, our plastic pollution problem. That is a systemic problem. That, that's a systemic problem, right? We need to change the system that are that's much more powerful than we are, much larger than we are. Um, and we can exert influence and we should, yeah, 